Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone, we are back in the paddock today and I'm delighted to welcome Paige Fuller, who swapped Exeter University to become a national hunt jockey. How are you today, Paige? I'm very well, thank you. Well, we finally meet, you've been busy and you're on a day off today. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I have been giving Stephen um, a miserable time trying to get hold of me. I'm not very good at replying to my messages. So, yeah, I'm finally here. And, um, yeah, it's nice to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, to start with, how's summer racing been going for you so far? Yeah, it's um, it's been going really well, actually. Um, obviously, last season, I rode out my claim. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer a conditional jockey. And so... I had a having had a quiet year with COVID last year, as in in the summer. Um, I kind of just lowered my expectations and was quite happy to accept that it, it might be quite a slow summer. But I've actually got some really um, nice rides actually through the summer. Already had a few winners, so yeah, really pleased with how it's going so far. And you must be soon be thinking of a holiday, don't you? Get a break soon. Well, we do, but I, I think COVID might be getting in the way way of that. We've got um we've got a two week break in August, but I'm not going to be double jabbed till halfway through that. So, I don't think we're going to be going abroad, and um I'm not sure there's going to be much left uh, on the market in the middle of August to get get away in England. But you know, it'd be nice to get away, and we've got a few days here and there through the summer. Um, next week, I think there's no racing. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So we, we do get these these patches with sort of days off and that, which um, which is nice just to to recharge and and you know gather gather yourself together again. Well, that's one of the advantages of being a bit older that you I've been double jabbed, so that's uh, one of the benefits. <laughs> yeah. But talking about COVID, how how has it affected your career I mean, last year when you know summer racing was off? I think we, you know, as jockeys are very lucky that whenever, you know, we can ride whatever horses. So I was lucky. I I, um, I went straight back to Andrew Bolding to ride out all through COVID. And actually, to be perfectly honest, it was it was a really nice change. Like, obviously, we lead very hectic lifestyles. Um, and actually, the first lockdown was was quite enjoyable. You know, I rode out every day and kept my fitness up um it was it was quite a it was quite a struggle coming back into racing um not not from that it was a a struggle to go back into racing um that I didn't want to it was more actually the racing was so slow when it first started that there weren't many reasons for trainers to use me um I think I had four rides the first month racing came back um just because obviously you had one meeting a day so you know there was always the jockey available basically that the trainers wanted and as a three pound claim and normally you pick up rides by being you know someone's backup and all of that um and again it's why I sort of prepared myself this summer having lost my three pound claim um to have a very similar summer but actually that's why I'm so pleased that it's it's not worked out like that um but yeah last summer it was um it was quite, it, 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 it wasn't a tough summer, but it, it was nice to get into full flow in September, October time when racing started getting more often. It was noticeable that, you know, all the rides started picking up and, and the momentum started getting going again. Well, you must have ridden some nice horses at Andrew Boldings. Oh, I ride some lovely horses at Andrew Boldings. <laughs> and the <laughs> thing that's lovely about Andrews is um, they're all middle distance horses. so you could easily argue that a lot of them are bred to be jumpers too. So it's not like sitting on these six furlong horses or five furlong horses that I've got absolutely no clue about. 
I can actually sort of understand a bit more um, about them, but they're lovely horses and uh, I'm very spoilt to get to spend my summers there. Right, well, let's just go back to where it all started. I know you began with pony racing, is that right? Yeah, I started uh, I started pony racing when I was nine. It had literally just started then as well, so I was quite lucky that I had such a long time in pony racing. Though I wasn't very good at it, to be honest. <laughs> I never won a pony race in my seven years of doing it, so um, it, it gave me a lot of experience, though, and I, I am grateful for that, definitely. Oh, so the pony racing wasn't a grounding to where you finished up, where you are now? Well, I, I definitely think it helps. You do learn some really key key factors um, in, in pony racing. You, you learn about the start of a race. You, you don't necessarily learn about tactics, but there are plenty of things you can learn from the pony racing circuit. And definitely when I started pointing at 16, I, I'd say that it, it had helped me massively. Um, but yeah, I hadn't, hadn't learned what the winner's enclosure was like, that's for sure. <laughs> So when you started point to point racing at that time, you hadn't um, considered going to become a professional jockey, though. No, definitely not. We're talking ten years ago now, so the the, the national hunt racing scene was very different. Uh, you know, there was Lucy Alexander, who who very soon after that became champion conditional jockey. But I very much had in my head that the only way to be a successful amateur was to ride. Not well, a successful lady jockey was to ride nice horses, point pointing and possibly under rules. And at that point, I very much saw the only route as well was trying to get a good job. Well, it was either working and starting your own point to point yard, like you know, Claire Hart and Hannah Lewis and, and lots of other um point to point jockeys were doing, either that or trying to get a very good job and be able to pay for some nice horses to ride. So since I was very lucky, I um, had a good education um, and I got some good results in my exam. So my initial aim was to try and do the latter, um, but it didn't last very long doing that. <laughs> yeah, you went to, is it Exeter University? Yeah, I started, yeah. I did half a term at Exeter after okay. a gap year. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so you, um, so you had a gap year and then you went to university and then you left after a short period was that yeah it was I I did I did three months work in France when I first left school and then I came back and helped my parents train point to points at home and, and was just riding out all over the place and when when I went to university to be honest I didn't I ended up mostly mostly riding out every morning because I got bored sat around at uni and I never made it to I probably made it to three lectures so I very quickly realised that university I could always go back to, but my riding wasn't going to wait. So I just kicked on and, and tried to make the most of my riding. And I read you rode your first winner during the 13-14 season. So how old were you then? Uh, my first, yeah, that would be my first winner under rules was, I must have been 17. So, yeah, quite a long time ago now. <laughs> and and where, where did you ride your first winner? Um, I had my first winner under rules on a horse called That's Rhythm at Bangor in a hunter chase. He was a lovely horse. We were, we were really, really lucky um, to, to, to get him. Uh, Sally Duckett and Jeff Deacon, who trains, who trains on the flat, they, they had bought him for a... A novice rider he, he was he was a he was lovely he was a lovely chap called Nick Wakefield and he was a rower and he turned up to the yard and said I want to ride in a race can you find me a horse so they bought him this horse and he he won lots of races on him and they they when he sort of decided he'd had enough they Sally came up to us and said look we'll go and win the Arga finals because there's there was this big lady series back then um sponsored by Arga um she said look you can win this race this race and this race and you know we'll we'll finish winning the Stratford Ladies Hunter Chase. And to be fair, that's exactly what the horse did. Um, and he was a he was a fabulous horse. He, I rode him in the Fox Hunters at Cheltenham as well. Um, and he was he was great fun. He he was a lovely horse for us all. So was your mum and dad there that day when you had your first winner? Then 
I don't think dad was there mum was there but I don't think dad was there <laughs> so yeah it was it was lovely <laughs> and you were champion amateur uh, the 16-17 and the 17-18 season at that time That's were you at Jamie Snowden's then or yes I was um I I don't believe I wasn't I was riding out for him in the second season but I I wasn't full time there for the second season I was sort of exploring my options um as such um just trying to work out what what I was going to do because as I say it's it's always been a real toss up I never even to that point I didn't think that I would be able to be a professional jockey especially at the end of the first amateur you know championship I I realized that it was becoming rather expensive to drive around the country um, to ride all these hunt courses. And I still didn't quite believe that I'd be able to make a career out of it. So I was trying to sort of work out if I could balance um, a career with um, my riding. And again, my riding took over and I realised that I was getting plenty of rides that I would be able to, you know, carry on for a little bit longer, getting paid for it as a professional. Um, and so I decided to make a turn because it's quite lucky. Uh, there's a rule that says um, you can ride 25 runners as a professional and still turn back amateur. So I thought at that point I had nothing to lose. But again, I still didn't think that it, <laughs> I, I'd end up here. And, you know, I'm just it's credit to everyone kind of over over many years that, that I've been able to do this. And, you know, I don't think there is enough credit nowadays given to these female riders from many years ago that I can basically have a fairly normal career in in racing because of them and I'm very grateful for that. It sounds like you've been following your passion to to be a jockey but what was the final decision to turn professional? Um, Just the, the the amount of support that I had you, you know you always sort of I was never attached to any big yards and you always hope you pick up rides in amateur races and you hope that you'll keep riding winners, but it doesn't always mean that you'll, you'll keep your contacts with certain people. And I, I actually realized that I had a very, very um, loyal base of trainers that were using me on a regular basis. And especially Jamie, you know, he was, he was still using me a lot and I had been there a, a, a long time and, when I approached him about, you know, taking out my license, he was very supportive. Um, and he has been the whole way through my career. So, you know, it was, I, I was just, it was the right time. Um, you know, and I just started riding for the late Zoe Davison as well. Um, and that all seemed to fit into place. Everything just fit into place, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm just so pleased I did it, to be honest. <laughs> Oh, it sounds like it. it certainly beats being at university, doesn't it? And you've now uh, ridden nearly a hundred winners. It must have been a Got great. Sen- sorry. sorry, no, no, eight to go. <laughs> eight to go. So it's ninety-two. Eight I said nearly a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, look out for you when you reach your hundred. Um, and it must have been a real sense of achievement when you rode seventy-five winners to lose your claim. Definitely, because there there are many female jockeys that have done it and more than anything else as I said earlier I think it wasn't a big deal which is what I obviously it's a big deal for any jockey to ride out their claim but the fact that it wasn't any more of a big deal the fact that I was a female doing it I really I really I really enjoyed because that's how it should be if that makes sense you know it's not it's not groundbreaking me do it it's a great achievement as a jockey but it wasn't a groundbreaking achievement and I really hope that it would just become the normal you know it should be normal that females are riding out their claims and I can't remember whether I was the sixth or seventh maybe who did it but hopefully there will be plenty more and and to me as well I think again it goes back to the fact that I really hope that there are plenty more jockeys that can do what I've been able to do female jockeys really well, we've had uh, Bryony win, winning the King George and, and Rachel Blackmore being the top jockey at Cheltenham and also winning the Grand National. That says everything, really, for, that, you know, females are jockeys. They're not, not, not female jockeys, they're jockeys. Yeah, so, exactly. Well, well done to you to 
that you've actually uh, reached your claim. But uh, and and I'm sure you'll get this a hundred fairly soon. Now, I was going to talk about um, your Grade Two win at Sandown, which is probably your highlight of your career so far. But I just wanted to talk to you about what it's like to be a national hunt jockey. Um, it's not it's not all glamour, is it? Uh, there's lots of things that uh, make it a a challenging job. I mean, what about you said already about the travelling? You, you must be, you know, like an Uber taxi driver going around the country. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the traveling, the traveling is different from from many sort of perspectives. Uh, obviously, doing all that driving, you, you do get used to it, and and actually, it's a good network of jockeys. I wouldn't say many jockeys really um, have issues, proper issues with each other. So we do tend to try and share driving as much as possible. So we'll meet people, and you know, we will try and take that. Um, some you know to try and reduce our driving a little bit by doing that obviously it's you know it's it doesn't happen all the time so uh you do have to do some of the long drives yourself but it's also very difficult because when you're trying to organize um I was also saying to you earlier I think the organization of of our lives is 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 quite difficult as well you know you've got to be working out where you're racing you've also then got to work out logistically who, which trainers you're going to be able to go into that week and then you'll have all sorts planned and then you'll be sent in to a different race course to where you thought you were going and then all plans change. And when you're in the car so much, it's very difficult to use your phone. So logistically trying to get, it's a massive juggling act half the time, just trying to juggle trainers that need you here on this day and other trainers that want you to fit them in. And, 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 you know, I, I obviously love schooling horses and, and, teaching babies to jump that's one of the best bits of the job but trying to logistically fit everyone in together it's like a massive jigsaw puzzle really <laughs> there must be some good and bad drivers to share the cars with you don't have to tell me who they are but uh, do you like driving yourself i don't mind driving I- i've definitely got used to it over the years and as you say um there are some people that you know are you, you quite enjoy going with <laughs> and and some people that make you a bit more nervous but on the whole, everyone's very well practiced. So if they haven't, if they haven't crashed yet, you sort of hope that it's not you're not going to be the unlucky one anyway. <laughs> well, that's not the main danger of your job because the main danger is actually when you're actually riding. Do you ever consider the dangers when you're jumping fences and hurdles? I think it's all over so quickly. Um, you, you don't necessarily have a chance to think about it. I mean, everyone knows if you start worrying about it, then I think that's probably your time is is done. Uh, it's we're quite lucky that we hopefully have a lot of time. You know, you ride for yards that you probably go in and help them out, and you've probably sat on the horses at home. You've probably helped teach them how to jump. So to a certain extent, you'll you've got to have faith in your own talent, I suppose, that you've got that horse jumping right at home. But the thrill of it's great and. Yes, you'll ride something that you might not be looking forward to, but actually it's a part of the job and it it is it is worth it. And you don't you don't you don't really think about it. I I I you know, obviously you'll be you know, there'll be some horses you don't look forward to, but no, it wouldn't it wouldn't worry me as such. <laughs> but you've had you've you yourself have had some injuries, haven't you? You've broken your ankle. Yeah, my ankle was probably probably my worst break. Um I spent three months on crutches with that so I was off racing for I think just over four months um but again it's part it's part of the parcel uh and you just can't really think about it obviously the last year or so um with poor Lorna you know it's it does bring it home and it did you know it naturally shapes you a little bit but at the end of the day we do 50,000 miles a year in the car you could easily have someone who's under the influence crash into you and you know, it might be more likely that it happened on the race course, but there are so many other places that, you know, you can get hurt as well, aren't there, that you kind of just have to get on with it and not think about it. But what's it like when you, because you love riding so much and you're off for three or four months like you were with your ankle, what's it like then? <laughs> Injuries are tough. I actually, I saw Lily Pynchon at um, Stratford yesterday and she's had her first bad injury uh, she broke her back at Chepstow in April 
as she's climbing the walls, she keeps calling me up saying, I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> she keeps telling she said to me, she keeps telling her boss, I'll be able to come back into the yard next week and potter her about. And he keeps telling her just to stay at home and she'll get the all clear from the doctors. But no, I know how she feels. It's it, it mentally it's tough, but you I think it's a great time to mentally grow when you have an injury as well, because you do have to manage yourself so much more and, and we're very spoiled as jockeys to have such great rehab centres in the in the jo- injured jockey fund centres. You've got um, Jack Berry, um, Oaksy House and Peter O'Sullivan and I'm luckily only 20 minutes from Oaksy House and they're very good at getting you in and keeping your rehab going, your exercises going because there's always exercises you can do that don't stress your injury. And a lot of jockeys, they can go and be residents there. Um, so even if you live just down the road and you've had a really nasty accident, you can still go and live in there for a bit. And and, and it's a real community there. Um, you, you end up being in groups of other jockeys that are also injured and you progress together. And, you know, everyone's in the same boat. So it's a real, it's an amazing setup there that I think we're very, very lucky to have. Another area where jockeys um, in the news as well, uh, where you're getting online abuse, some horrible um, vile abuse for when you don't win races. How do you deal with that sort of thing if, if you get some yourself? I think we're all we're all subject to it um, with the social media, with social media. Obviously, social media gives everyone the ability to voice their opinion um and it's a very gray area as to where that line is um and I think I'm very lucky that uh I don't ride high profile horses I'm not riding in so many high profile race where there's probably more money on the horses I'm riding um so I am quite fortunate I don't think I'm I'm not subject to as much as some people I think that means that I cope with it a lot better when I do get it because it's not there every day you know some jockeys I'm sure if they're riding favorites every single day and they're not winning because not every favorite wins um they will be getting more and more abuse every day you know unfortunately people are in very bad situations sometimes and they take it out on you you know I've had someone threaten well uh, well say that they hope to see me die and me break my neck, you know, online. And and actually, it's that awful that you kind of have to go, well, it's it must be awful for them to feel the need to send you that message. But as I say, I'm lucky I'm not subject to loads of it, so it doesn't affect me in the same way. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's not, there's black and white if we've won a race or not. And... So I'm being repetitive because we've already spoken about this beforehand, but I thought I'd say it on here as well. But you know, um, it's black and white whether we've won a race or not. And for a lot of other TV presenters and stuff, it's not actually black and white. So you can feel like you've done a really good job as a TV presenter and be really happy about it. Get on your phone and get called all the names under the sun. And that must be a lot more personal and damaging, I think, to someone's confidence than realistically if you've got a favourite beat yes, you're going to question whether you've given that a good ride or not. But most of the time, you kind of know if you've given that a good ride or not. So you either brush it off and say, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Or you go back, well, we always go back and look through them and you just go back and you go, actually, yes, I haven't given that a good ride. How am I going to improve the next time? And as I say, I'm not subject to loads of it. So that's probably why I can be so relaxed about the situation. Well, it's not a very pleasant part of the sport and um, hopefully some action is taken when people do step too much over the line because it, it must affect some people because uh, everyone's, oh. not, everyone's not as strong as each other and you do need support and especially the, the sort of period we've been living in the last 12 to 18 months as well. Yeah, it's, it's very worrying and I think more, what's more worrying is it's the state that the people are in behind the screen as well. It's, it's really worrying to think that there are so many people that are so deeply affected by those situations and how 
they are just losing their 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 lives are so um you know all consumed by their gambling you know and that's that's the, the flip side of of what we do and it is quite sad to think that you know we can cause that but you know at the end of the day the social media companies don't you know they they don't seem to do enough they are getting better but i've reported messages on instagram and because i would always you know if there is abuse i'd always report the message report the person and you know i've i've i haven't had so many recently but earlier um they were they would send me a notification saying this didn't breach our community guidelines and you're thinking well what does then but luckily you know i think they are obviously taking a bit more action because i haven't got many of you know i haven't got any more messages saying that so you know as you say they do need to take action though and you know unfortunately we did the social media blackout earlier in the year and to be perfectly honest i I doubt anyone remembers it at all i don't think it's made any difference really um and but but we have to be realistic that this is just also a culture issue and you know there was the i didn't watch the map really but i did hear afterwards last night that um because sorry it's the day after the England got through to the quarterfinals for the podcast listeners. Um, but you had English fans booing the Germans when they were singing the national anthem, which that's not social media's fault. You know, that's that's on terrestrial TV. And and we've still got issues deep rooted in culture. Um, so we can't just blame social media companies, really, can we? No, 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 you're right. I mean, we should be respecting people's national anthems. Um I was watching the game last night and, you know, the group I was with weren't happy that, you know, we were booing, people were booing the German national anthem. It's totally unacceptable. On a more positive note, um, how do you <laughs> relax yourself? Um, that's a very good question. I'm not, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> driving. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, what whilst we're driving? Or... No, what, no, not driving. Well, you can tell me what your music oh, no. is, but... <laughs> But I mean, apart from driving, how do you relax? Um, I'm not very good at re- relaxing, to be honest. I think sort of, I'm I'm trying. I, I'm very lucky. I've got a very supportive supportive partner, and um, he does try and <laughs> help get me away from racing. Something he's teaching me how to play golf at the moment. Um, I feel I can finally admit that because we're three years in, and I can now just about get around 18 holes so I feel like I can now admit to the fact that he's trying to teach me but you know I, I do I do I'm, I am enjoying that and it's going to sound really stupid but we bought a house last year and I'm actually really enjoying being out in the garden as well and just getting out and doing a bit of gardening I sound so old <laughs> but actually just getting away any chance to put your phone down and just actually get away from it's so easy to sit, sit down and watch tv and just scroll through your phone and you're not actually switching off are you whereas actually um i do sound like such a granny saying this but getting out into the garden and just pottering and doing a bit of deadheading and planting up a few things it is it is uh, it it has really helped me this summer in particular i think (laughs) well let's talk about your i think your most famous victory a grade two win on anything for love at Sandown in February 2021. Is that your career highlight? I'd say it must be. It was it was very surreal having my career highlight with no one there though. It was it was a very surreal experience, really. Um and you know, I was very lucky that that day Gavin had to go to Fontwell. They actually inspected Fontwell that morning. Um, and I hadn't realised they were inspecting because obviously I wasn't there. And, and we were schooling that morning and Gavin turned to me and he said, I bet you're lucky that Fontwell's on, happy that Fontwell's on. I was like, I didn't even realise it was an option that it wasn't. Um, but, you know, she's a she's a lovely mare. Um, the, she's obviously a half-sister to Sizing John. And I won two bumpers on her. Um, and... Obviously, Gavin, you know, rode her over hurdles, and we've always thought a lot of her. So to get on her on 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 that day, yeah, was very very special because you don't often get opportunities to ride in races like that, let alone let alone win them. So no, I was, yeah, it was a great day. And I read that she was at that time scheduled to go to Cheltenham, but she didn't 
did she pick up an injury or no um no she we weren't sure what what we were going to do with her um afterwards it was sort of rain dependent we obviously had a very dry march it, it went to good ground obviously uh for Cheltenham and I think the races just weren't quite quite right for her because obviously the mare's straight mare's hurdle was two and a half but it, you know that would have been quite a deep end and then the mare's novice is a two mile race so it wasn't really you know her, her optimum she's going to be a stayer in time so on good ground it would have been a bit much of an ask to, to to run her there we 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 had hope that we'd get another run into her before the end of the season but as I say the rain just never came before she had to go on her summer holidays so yeah we schooled her up over a fence before she went out on her holidays and um yeah I think that would be the plan for next season which is really exciting well hopefully you'll get a chance to ride her this winter then possibly it would be nice <laughs> it would be nice but you know it, we'll, we'll see how the season season goes anyway <laughs> And, and talking of Cheltenham, Cheltenham, are they the courses you like to ride, like Cheltenham, Aintree, the big courses? Yeah, it's 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 lovely to ride there. Um, obviously, I have been lucky enough to ride a winner at Cheltenham on Monbeg Theatre at the April meeting, and and that was another that was another massive highlight of mine of my career. Sorry, and um, but actually, I love winning races. So. <laughs> A lot of the time, if you're riding at the festival, you know, I quite happily go. Obviously, I'd love to ride at the festival, but if I can go and win a race elsewhere, I'd much rather go and win a race elsewhere because you always go to Cheltenham and you're riding good horses. You know, you're not taking a horse there that's not in form or that isn't a nice horse. So, you know, you're always going to be sat on a nice animal going to Cheltenham, but actually persuade yourself that it's probably got a chance and then it run a really nice race. And it could finish 15th, 13th, 15th out of 24 or something. And, you know, it's probably run a really nice race, but you're always going to be slightly more disappointed. Um, so I do you, I do like riding those sorts of tracks, but at the same time, I just like riding winners. And I think my winning race track is probably the Plumpton or Fontwell or somewhere like that. So, um, so yeah, I've probably got more fond memories at tracks like that. And what are your thoughts of um, the news the last couple of weeks that Cheltenham might go to five days instead of four? I I might be being really naive, but I, any chance for our sport to bring in more revenue, I can't see it being a bad thing. You know, they're only going to end up adding on probably two more races, aren't they? Well, they took off a race to add on the Mayor's Chase, so realistically you're only going to be adding on one more race. and. It is a real shame um, for the likes of Kempton and Utoxeter to have to share the Saturday. I think that is a real shame taking away from obviously the um, Midlands National and the the consolation race at Kempton. Um, but look, I, I don't I don't know why it would be such an awful thing to happen as such. I'm I'm fairly on the fence, really. So <laughs> it certainly looks like it's coming. I think fairly soon, though, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, was it twenty twenty three? Is it so? Yeah, um, they've, they've not confirmed it, but I think that's the uh, the direction of travel. I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what about your own ambitions now in the sport? You're still very young, so uh, you've got lots of riding ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, I, it's funny as, as we were saying earlier. I've, I've always sort of exceeded my expectations and. I remember sitting down, having having ridden out my claim, and sitting down, and everyone goes, "Okay, well, what's what's your next sort of next target?" And I sort of said to myself, "I was like, oh, well, obviously, I suppose naturally the next target is riding a sort of graded graded winner, but that's probably slightly not unachievable. But you kind of sit there and you're like, well, that's not a very healthy target to set for yourself. Um, and then it happened. <laughs> so, but yeah, so I think. I've always, to a certain extent, hit hit my um, targets, and and it's always hard to set new targets as such because you don't want to overface yourself. But you know, obviously, hundred winners by the end of the year, I'd like to think that's very achievable. And then, to be honest, I just I'd like 
do get the next, you know, up to 150, I think, you know, as long as the ball keeps rolling, just getting better horses to ride, better quality of races, you know, that's that's sort of the aim. That's always the aim, isn't it? You know, I'm lucky to be attached to what I think are pro- progressive yards as well. You know, Jamie's really progressing um, with his quality of animals and Andy Irvine, um, he's got some really nice courses coming in for next season um, and all sorts of other people that I'm riding for. I'm I'm very lucky that they they know how to train winners. So so as long as I can um, keep their faith and keep riding the winners, hopefully it will just keep a nice upward curve. Would be nice. Well, it looks like like you made the right decision not to well not to continue at Exeter University. Uh, keep on riding the winners, keep improving, and thank you very much for joining me on the paddock and the pavilion. No, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and now on Instagram at The Pad and Pav. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. We all know a guy who only occasionally shaves for big occasions, and it's because that occasional shave really hurts. It's the time of year for big occasions, and yet there he is, suffering with that cheap drugstore razor. Let's help him out. Henson Shaving's line of razors, built with aerospace precision, deliver a smooth shave your dad, brother, and even son can enjoy, eventually. With replacement blades just 10 cents each, you'll buy it once, and they'll use it for life. How's that for the perfect gift? Celebrate with 100 free blades on your first purchase, and no subscription headaches. HensonShaving.com slash holiday.